capital budgeting, and using it to make decisions. As always, I want to just start by reviewing what we discussed in the previous chapter, looking at alternatives, using relevant information to determine what to do, not to do, discontinue, and what the impact will be. We were talking about having to decide if to discontinue a product, whether to outsource, whether to sell a product or service um, partially in the process or fully complete that process, and all of the decisions that are, are, are based on one alternative or another using relevant information, relevant costs. Today, we're going to talk about budgeting because it fits so well into relevant costs and why we choose one alternative over another. Um, capital investments are going to be long-lived assets. Um, how are we going to acquire them, if we acquire them, and, and with duration, get a payback or a rate of return in making those capital investment decisions, using time value of money, also discounted cash flows. Again, we're looking at long-term decision-making in terms of fixed assets. So why is it important? Well, it's important because we want to be able to purchase these equipment and plant items in such a way that we get a return for those that, that outlay. Um, generally speaking, capital budgeting is going to be all about long-lived assets, very, very expensive assets, and it's important for an organization to truly, truly think things through um, over the long term about this asset, what it's going to do, and how we can get the most out of it. So we want to know how to get back that money. That's the payback period. We want to know what, how wealthy or how profitable that organization, that particular product is for us. That's going to be our rate of return. We're going to also talk about what's the present value of it right now and what's our internal rate of return. It's really getting the most out of our assets and being able to quantify that with these ratios, etc. So cash flows. Cash flows is money coming in. An asset, generally speaking, is used for the purpose of generating revenues. So if you look at it from that point of view, that's exactly what capital budgeting is and what it focuses on the cash flow. How can we generate more cash flows by using this asset? And so how do you quantify the cash flow for a capital asset when it's not, not, not always necessarily attributable to revenue? We have to bring bridge that gap. How do we use this asset to generate revenue? And then how do we use that money and convert it to cash flows over a period of time. We may use an interest rate to do that. So capital budgeting really is gonna be identify the capital um, expenditures. We're gonna estimate, create a, a inflow of what we believe this particular asset is gonna bring into the organization in terms of real money. We're gonna also analyze the potential investment, get a payback. How many years or weeks or months will it take us to get that money back? And then we're going to talk about rationing and performing audits and really about looking back. How well did we do? Did we do based on how well did we do compare, compare with our budget? And so actual is going to really be important to look at. So looking at assets, um, and I want to make certain I review part one, I guess. If we're focusing on cash flows, how can we say that this particular investment is going to bring us cash flows. It's going to be our desirability. It's going to be on how we can connect the cash that we receive in revenue over time and also using an interest rate that will help us do that. So payback is how long it times to recover the money that we paid out. We pay out $100,000 for this particular asset. How long will it take for us to generate the revenues to cover what we paid out? And it does measure how quickly we can expect to recover the investment. When you make a capital expenditure, that's an investment. So payback is going to be a, a, a small but a small but useful calculation. And I don't like to get so into the calculations. I would like to focus on what this particular ratio or this particular calculation provides you. What information does it provide you? And not always is a payback period something that everybody needs. It may have a very limited use, but knowing how to calculate and understanding what information it provides is far more important than being particularly uh, accurate. Right now, just understand what the ratio is, 
understand how it's calculated and how it's used, and then how it compares with other ratios in determining um, the usefulness of your in capital investment. And again, it's all about knowing how long it's going to take, because if you are going to invest two point three million dollars in a capital um, uh, asset, you want to know if you're going to get that money back and how long it will take. How long will it take for you to generate the sufficient revenues based on that asset to get that money back? And that could very well be a determining factor if you buy the asset in the first place. So in this chapter, I'm just giving you various ways of determining your payback periods. But in the end of it all, what's the point if you don't know what it means and what it gives you and what its limitations are? So it focuses on time. It doesn't really give a whole lot of credibility or a lot of emphasis on profitability. It only talks about cash pay flows during the payback period. And it definitely ignores any period after that. So that's a limited limitation. And it does not consider residual value. That Not all assets are used up to nothing. There are some value at the end of a life of some assets, capital assets. And it doesn't consider that. But the accounting rate of return does focus on net income. And that's, in some cases, can be more useful information than just the cash flows. Um, it's using fund account, it's using accrual-based accounting. So again, you're going back to your financial accounting and using that information. So the annual rate of return, albeit a, a, a much more straightforward calculation, has its place and it is not something that you should consider or rule out. I think in totality, using them both and looking at them and, and making an intelligent decision on which one is most relevant and most accurate way to predict your use of your capital asset. And that's what I'm pointing out here is no wrong or right here. It's more a matter of preference and depending on the capital assets being purchased. So you could use an accounting rate of return for one capital asset and use a payback period for another. Again, it's not about wrong or right. It's about a different perspective and which makes the best sense for the organization. And again, you're back to the same decision rule. Does it exceed your rate of return? Then you should go for it. And this is just um, not just for capital assets, basically for any decision that you have to make. You have to look at what's going to be the, the cost versus benefit. And this is really like a cost versus benefit um, decision. Is it, is it more beneficial for me to, to make this decision? And given all of the other uh, factors that you consider, you have to make, you have to determine this is what I'm going to do. And I think this is the right choice. Making choices based on sound, quantifiable information. Time value money basically is putting a dot, putting time in a percent over money. It's saying a dollar received today based on a, res, a rate of return will be worth a dollar received in the future. And, you, and basically investing money earns um, invested money earns income or interest over time. So it is basically taking your principal and your number of periods and a rate of interest and calculating what that value is right now. What is, let's say that $50,000 is the future value, but you want to take that $50,000 and bring it back to the present, which means that that $50,000 may not be worth $50,000 in the future. It may very well be worth $30,000 right now. So it's just taking a value of money and incorporating time element into it and a time element depends on an interest rate factor an interest rate it also considers um inflation and the economy so again it can it can be very very useful to see what money is worth now versus what it's worth in the future and vice versa and this is just an illustration of a principal interest based on simple interest, which is the principal times the interest time to time, versus when you have a compound interest calculation and you see that, that there's a $383 difference. This becomes very, very important. Compound interest gives you a truer measure of how money changes or how the value changes over time. And again, future versus present value. Again, what's worth now, we put the time element using a computed interest rate and to tell you what the future value is. For purposes of this um, course, we're not trying to teach you how to calculate future and present values solely. We want you to understand what they mean and how this information is useful in 
um, determining what your value of your assets are right now and how it would look in the future. Now, what I wanted to make certain and clear in this course here is this is a this is not a finance course. And in finance, we would be going through a tremendous amount more detail and drilling down much more um, carefully all of the different scenarios and using annuities, um, present value of a single payment, et cetera. In this course, we're really going to gloss the surface. So I would say concept is far more important than actual computation, understanding what we're doing, why we're doing, and how it relates. And then you can consider the various calculations that one needs to compute in order to get the desired output. And I'm giving you here a lot of different ways to look at it. And I don't want to spend time on the calculations because I truly believe the calculations can obscure the reality of what present value is and what it provides the user in, in, in that role of making a decision on capital assets. Discounted cash flows to make cash capital investment decisions. Again, we're trying to determine what our cash flow would be for an asset that we're purchasing, a capital asset. And what we want to do in this is what is the value of the cash flows I expect to receive in real dollars? And when we convert it to a net present value, we're taking a future value and we're discounting it back to now. We can get an idea of what its value is. What we want to know about future flows of money and how those numbers look right now. That's the discounted net present value calculations. Now, normally I wouldn't um, spend a, a lot of time on one example in this video. I think it, it does help to be able to understand um, what what happens with money when you invest it and how it looks over time. So when a capital investment is made, what this particular example is trying to show you is if you have a flows of money of 305000 every single year, what would be the value of that 305000 in five years? Now, this particular example is assuming a number of things. It's assuming the interest rate is 14%, which is the I. It's assuming the number of years is five. And it says present value of an annuity. This part of it always adds a level of complexity that I don't particularly care for because students need, don't understand what that means. Present value means what it is um, worth right now. Annuity is somewhat a series of payments, equal amounts, generally speaking, over time. So if it's on a value of an annuity, that annuity amount is going to be the $305,000. It's going to be that one payment being made over and over and over again. So that's what an annuity is, a, sing a payment over time. A single payment, generally speaking, over time. So the present value of a single payment over time, considering five years of duration and a rate of 14%. So in, in essence, this particular example is saying that if I have a 305,450 investment and I want to know what that number will be, over five years, assuming I have a return or interest rate of 14%, it should be close to $1,048,000. That's all it's saying. And the reason why we want to know what that is, is because if we say my, my investment of a $305,000 is worth $1,048,000 and I make an initial investment of a million dollars, I am basically saying my present value is $48,610. That change, what does that $48,000 represent? It represents the return, the cash return of this investment. So if my net present value is positive, it's going to be an indication of investing. If it's negative, it's an indication of not investing. Now, I'm giving you a very simplistic viewpoint of this. It is far more complex than just does my net present value, um, is it positive? Uh, I would say it's far more, um, 
it makes far more sense in light of an example. But in reality, however, it is far more complicated than this, which is why I'm not, I don't want to overly emphasize the computations. I want to emphasize what this information means and how it helps an individual company make a decision. Because this is not a finance class and I don't want to get too deep into it because it's not necessary. What is necessary is the concept. The concept that you'll need to understand what's happening and why a decision is made in this way. And under equal payments, same opportunity. Again, with this equal unequal payments each and every year, we can present value it back. Meaning we have a future number and we want to know what that number means now, what that number is right now. And you can do the same thing. I take my present value number. I have 100000 What is that 100000 going to look like five years from now, assuming I get a rate of interest of 5% over five years? So again, we're just trying to get an idea of what the number is going to be, what the present value is, and how it, re and how it relates to a future value, and comparing that to what I'm going to actually outlay right now. So if I have a million dollars right now, but what if I make a series of payments of 300000 and discount it over five years with the interest rate of X percentage, compare that ending number to what my initial investment is. And if my initial investment or my net present value is higher, then I think it's a good idea to make that investment. Again, this chapter talks about a lot of computations and I don't like the computations because it um, sometimes it obscures the reality of why we are doing it in the first place. Should we take this investment is the answer. Should we take this investment? And if we should, what would be the output? What would be the gain? What would we be gained if we did it? And if we gain an, a higher rate of return and we quantified it, the decision to make this investment is absolutely warranted and a fiscally prudent one to do. Sometimes I go backwards. An internal rate of return is what they in turn what they expect to earn when investing in this um, project. It's definitely based on cash flows, and it considers the cost of investment and the present value of those investment cash flows. Obviously, you want a higher rate of return, a higher internal rate of return, in order to make that decision to um, uh, take that investment or that particular capital expenditure. And again. These computations mean nothing if you don't understand why we're doing it and what the process is. We're doing it to determine if we can invest and we get a highest rate of return if we do. And that's what we're trying to accomplish here. And again, unequal um, annual payments does not in any way uh, make, make it impossible to make that calculation. You simply will have to be computing the present value at every single year, given these different cash flow numbers. So again, I would say when you're looking through this chapter, just look at the payback period, what it offers, and compare it with, with the internal rate of return. Obviously, um, the payback period is pretty straightforward, but it does not get complex enough to deal with uneven cash flows. It doesn't consider time value of money when, when you're dealing with um, different risk and recovery period, it's, it just doesn't consider it. So we have to think about that if it's necessary in this case to consider time value of money. And then also looking at the capital value when you compare it with the net present value and the internal rate of return. Again, these are different methods and depending on the need of the organization and the complexity of the capital investment that they're trying to um, decide on, the, the appropriate measure would determine that. Um, this chapter does get into a lot of computations. My suggestion always with computations is why are we making this computation? What does it mean? How does it help me make a decision? What type of output am I gaining from this, um, this exercise? And does it help me understand the process of making a decision on a capital investment? It's far more significant than actually computing it. Why? Because if you don't know what the numbers mean, it doesn't matter if it's accurate or not. Accuracy is important only if it met, if you understand exactly what the process is, what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it applies to a decision. That's most important. Computing it is a matter of practice and a matter of using the right tools. 
I, grew, I do appreciate your time listening to this video, and I'm hopeful that you gain much from this chapter. Thank you very much.